Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Barbell Medicine YouTube channel. I am Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum. This is training vlog number 24. We've got questions from you guys. We've got form checks from you guys. Stay tuned to the end of the video to find out how to submit your own question and your own training video. Let's get into the question. So this first question is from Matthew McNulty. He asks, uh, from example one in the article, To Be a Beast, which I'll link below, do you still recommend that underweight novices eat a large calorie surplus for the first six to eight weeks of training? Would it depend on their training sensitivity? So I think that you could do a lot worse than if you're underweight and wanting to gain a lot of muscle mass and, and just starting training. You could do a lot worse than gaining weight um, the first six to eight weeks. Should it be a lot of weight? Well, I think at that point you have to start uh, like quantifying, you know, your terms and what you're saying. I don't think people should be gaining five or six pounds a week. Uh, that's probably not a, a good idea. And mainly because there are very few people on this planet who even half of that would be lean body mass, even if they're untrained. And people will say, well, I've seen this happen before. And my response to that is simply, no, you haven't. Um, <laughs> because, you know, when we look at actual data on this and we look at, um, you know, especially the population level data, you just don't see that sort of lean body mass increase uh, that rapidly, even on anabolic steroids, when you look at evidence that we have on that. So it seems highly unlikely uh, that somebody's act, you know, actually seeing that for what it is uh, accurately. Rather, there is some confirmation bias going on there. So how fast should your weight gain be? Uh, you know, again, that's going to depend on each individual person. Some people will put on more lean body mass than other folks. Some people put on more fat mass than other folks. And I think that, sure, that probably has something to do with where they fall on this uh, uh, training sensitivity, uh, athletic spectrum kind of scale, and just their overall response to a given training stimulus. So if the training stimulus may need to change to to kind of alter that balance. Um, I think a pound or two a week is reasonable. I think even if you're underweight, you're still going to be underweight for a while. Trying to become not underweight isn't really going to serve you well in the long term if you are focused on doing it as fast as possible. Because I, th I think the idea is you need to gain a little bit of weight over time or a little bit of weight consistently over time um, so that, uh, that you can get to the desired weight um, where you either optimally perform or that you prefer. But doing it quickly, I don't think serves somebody well long term. And I think there are way too many examples of that um, that we've uh, we've come across to recommend that routinely. Next question is from David Farrell. I'm allergic to whey, so my main protein supplement is casein powder containing 1.6 grams of leucine per 20 gram scoop. That's pretty low. I also eat eggs, fish, and red meat. I eat about one gram per pound of body weight. Do you think that supplementing with BCAAs will improve my muscle protein synthesis given that the casein does not contain as much leucine as whey and that it is not released as quickly? Uh, so I don't really love casein. I don't have huge problems with it. I just don't recommend it routinely. I don't think it does any better than whey and maybe worse than whey in some cases. And I think it's a little more expensive and this leucine content is not very high. So if you're doing two scoops of casein, then, uh, you know, that would be fine. I try to aim for about three grams of leucine and the full complement of essential amino acids per meal. That being said, I don't think micromanaging your amino acid intake is terribly useful. And I would ask, actually wonder why you're using casein in the first place if you're okay with eating all these other high quality protein sources. I don't know if you need casein. Um, so anyway, uh, further, I don't think that supplementing with BCAAs is terribly useful for you or anyone unless they're on a low protein diet. Um, they are a vegan and therefore, uh, or vegetarian, and for whatever reason aren't getting um, a good dose of essential amino acids, including the branched chain amino acids per meal. Um, or if you were going to use it for uh, uh, a competition situation where you um, are going to have multiple competitions per day, uh, and then you can use it in a rehydration solution, or you could use uh, use it before a workout, potentially for some fatigue management. Um, although, again, the evidence on that is is not the best, but there's some out there. So that's how I would use it. Otherwise, I wouldn't supplement with BCAs at all. I don't think that's terribly useful. Our next question is from Constantine Rymaruk. I have a question. I got the flu during my training block. What do I do? Do I stay home and rest for a week or do I continue training? Uh, so this is a question we get all the time. Should you train if, you, if you're sick? And my general uh, answer is I would almost always recommend training unless you represent a public health risk uh, to other people by getting them sick if you are infectious. So if you are infectious enough that you have to stay home from work, I don't think I would train unless you have your own gym, in which case it's just you and you're kind of confined to your own space. Uh, you're not going to make the illness worse, likely, uh, again, depending on what it is. But uh, my general rule of thumb is if you're infectious enough where you have to stay home, you probably shouldn't be going to a public place and train. 
Um, if it's your own gym, then all bets are off. Um, I train when I'm sick, you know, uh, unless uh, I fall into that former category. So the only weird thing is if you had mono, if it wasn't flu and you had mono and you're, you had some risk of splenomegaly and uh, maybe you don't train with uh, uh, with that because you were worried about uh, spleen rupture. Although I haven't seen it. I haven't seen any case reports of that from resistance training, but I think that's a theoretical risk uh, that I remember discussing with a few colleagues a while ago. But anyway, that's what I think about that. All right, this next question is from Nick Manapella. Hi, Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum, huge fan. It was an honor meeting you at the Brooklyn seminar. Thanks again for the cue on my deadlifts. It was really helpful. You're welcome. Uh, question is, you talk about how novices are untrained and you say that, uh, when you say that, does that mean that they are untrained to the main lifts, squat, bench, deadlift, or untrained as it never worked out before in their lives? So could you put a trainee on the novice in your progression if they have done only hypertrophy type work and never actually trained the deadlift or bench or squat? Uh, you can put anybody on a novice linear progression. It doesn't mean it's going to work. Um, so that's just end of that right there. The question is when I talk about people being untrained, what does that mean? It just means in whatever specific context that we were discussing that that person has not been formally trained with a progressive overload. So you could have a world level, uh, marathoner, great endurance athlete who's never resistance trained before, and they would be a novice in, uh, with resistance training. Um, just like you could have a person who's actually done a bunch of resistance training in the past, trap bar deadlifts only and, you know, dumbbell bench press and, uh, you know, what else? Uh, uh, well, uh, leg press and never squatted and then put them on a, the novice linear progression if that's what you wanted to do. And they'd see rapid progress in their strength within those lifts. Strength is very specific to the movement pattern, to the range of motion, to how far the muscles are stretched, to the joint angles to the velocity of the movement. So when you're evaluating outcomes based on strength performance on particular lifts, strength has to be very, very specific. And so if someone hasn't been exposed to progressive overload, progressively overloaded program before with the specific movements that you are giving priority, then they are untrained in that, uh, in that context. And so, yeah, when I refer to people who are untrained with regards to uh, resistance training, um, I'm usually referring to the, the big lifts just because I have a personal bias supporting them. But uh, as far, and that's that's usually in the context of strength. Um, hypertrophy is a different deal. Usually uh, a training that gets you stronger will also get you bigger muscles. Um, you know, there's, uh, as long as it's programmed correctly. But if someone only did higher rep work, I would not expect them to be very good at uh, generating high intensity efforts for like a 5RM, a 3RM, or a 1RM, and therefore uh, putting them on a program that progressively overloaded that and trained that would uh, improve their performance. That being said, I'm not geeked out about putting everybody on a novice linear progression. It's two or three months of their whole life. It doesn't matter where they end up at the end of the novice linear progression. It's not the best program. Um, for general development. We've discussed this ad nauseum and people get upset by it because they have this bias towards it. And it's like, look guys, just evaluate everything. Just evaluate the program itself uh, on its own, by its own merits and, and detractors. And, and then you'll come up with your own opinion. And that's fine. You don't have to share my opinion, but that's my opinion. I don't care if someone's on an LP or not. Um, Anyway, so if someone if someone's never trained squat, bench, deadlift, press before progressively uh, over time, and they really care about getting strong, you can put them on a strength training program. It doesn't. Uh, it likely um, should follow the same general principles as even a non-novices uh, program, meaning that it should have progressive overload. It should, you know, gradually increase in volume and stress, and you should be evaluating empirical outcomes over time and adjusting as necessary. So, hope that helps. All right, next question is from Jim Doty. I have a question for the doctors. I'm 58 and have been seeing a doctor for routine checkups. Uh, a few months back, I had full blood and urine done. Hopefully they didn't take all your blood and all your urine, uh, including total and free testosterone. I assume you mean full blood work and a urinalysis done. Okay. Uh, the total testosterone was 729 nanograms per deciliter, I'm assuming. The doctor said was a level he strives to achieve for people in TRT. All right, that's fine. <laughs> uh, that's a totally normal level. He never mentioned free testosterone and I didn't know enough about the subject to question him, but after some research, I think if I have it right, that the free value is more important. That's not true. Free value is not more important. They're equal, equally as important. Somebody with one that's low and the other one that's not low 
uh, or one that the other one that's normal, you don't necessarily treat them. And you're not telling me that you have any symptoms either, so I don't know why we would just pull the testosterone level anyway. Uh, so free was 60.2, uh, what is that, picogram per mil? Okay, so that's a normal level two. And the bioavailable uh, testosterone was also normal. So everything was normal here. Okay, the only real symptom I have is dozing off after an evening meal. You say that your plumbing still works and you have decent energy level. Uh, dozing off after the evening meal is not a symptom of low testosterone. So uh, I'm not trying to be short. I'm just saying that's, that's not a low testosterone symptom. Um, I'm not sure if this doctor would do anything for me since my levels are within normal ranges, but I could seek out private TRT. Of course you could. Yes. I'm wondering, in your opinion, if I should get retested or those levels would indicate an issue, I'd be happy to supply any additional information that you might need. And I realize your opinion would not be formal medical advice, but I value your opinion and appreciate your input. Uh, so first, I would refer you to the testosterone article by Dr. Baraki. He uh, covers this in detail. All of your levels are normal. I would not recommend any treatment for that because there are risks to the treatment and the benefits that you would have since you have normal, completely normal levels are likely low. The idea that having a higher testosterone level within normal limits improves your results as far as lean body mass goes, sexual function or uh, strength performance uh, is wrong and that we need to divorce that idea in our brains. Uh, people saying that are doing the uh, internet a massive disservice. So again, all of your levels were normal. The symptom that you mentioned, dozing off after evening meal has nothing to do with testosterone. And I, it, it is true that if you sought out private TRT uh, prescription, you could probably find it. They would inappropriately test your levels and that's how they would medically justify pr providing the prescription. Um, but yeah, I, I wouldn't do any of that. And uh, this, these numbers change day to day anyway. So I would expect them to vacillate over, you know, up and down. Um, anyway, so the whole thing on TRT is if you need it, if you're low and you have symptoms of being low, you should probably treat it, but you shouldn't just get a number before having symptoms because the number is not important. It'll, all it can do is nocebo you. And if you listen to enough people who tell you that you need to have really high testosterone levels to live a full complete life, then you might have noceboed yourself. Uh, in that in that in that regard and uh, again all of your normal your levels are normal so um, all right we'll carry on now we're gonna get into some lifting review so first up uh, this is dr. Michael Supples he's an emergency med resident down there in I forget, North Carolina South Carolina squatting you know these look all right Supples the hips shoot back a little bit out of the bottom that's why there's like this little disjointed movement so I'd keep your knees forward out of the bottom and uh, Try to clean up that bar path. Yeah, that rep looked okay, the last rep. All right, this next one, this is Angel Esperanza. Uh, this is, I think he said he was from Mexico, so I don't know what the weight is on the bar. It looks like 225, 245, maybe 255. Yeah. So I will pull your chin down. Yeah. And that's about four inches, five inches above parallel. So you're gonna have to, I, you're gonna have to take some weight off the bar, pull your chin down. You're gonna have to go about, yeah, five or six inches lower. So the way you're gonna do that is by pushing your knees forward and out, and uh, less weight on the bar. Yeah, you can see, you can see the knees cave in there. So why don't you take about mm, 60, 70 pounds off the bar, and uh, work on going. Uh, below parallel. You want the crease of the hip below the knee. Yeah, that one was maybe eight inches above parallel. So, all right, Chris, Christina Wong, she says is 155. That might be true. That's a 35, maybe two tens. Maybe, maybe miscounted. I don't know. All right, 155. So I don't love the shoes, but all right. So depth is good. Yeah, you know, these don't look bad. Long femur crew checking in. That, yeah, those two probably right at parallel. So I'd go a little lower on those last. Yeah, that one was all right. You know, if you get yourself some shoes and you make sure you go about an inch lower on the on a, the few of those reps, I think you'd be all right, Christina. Nice. Stephen A. I can't pronounce your last name. I know. I know. This is 425 for a set of five. Looks like a BNR bar. Yeah, I can't. I can't promise you that that looks that that's high because you're in all black. That one was to depth, and the angle is just a little strange. I think that first one might have been right. Yeah, third one was high too. Mm. 
Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, again, I'm not at hip level and I'm not directly from the side, so I can't say for sure, but everyone but that second rep looks to be a little high. The knee travel looks good and your hips shoot back out of the last one and then your head changes position around that last one. It's a heavy set, but I think you need to go a little lower and I think I'd want to see it from the dead side. So not the dead side like you're dead, but like profile shot, you know? All right. Garrett, I'm surprised you took your shirt off in this commercial gym. Congrats to you. So was this 205? Yeah, that one looks a little loose on your chest. I can tell because your elbow's moving around. You watch the elbow like just swing. So ideally I would tighten that up. And I think uh, unless this is close grip bench, uh, I would probably have you flare your elbows a little bit more. Yeah, don't tuck quite as much. <sighs> this is Kyer. Kyrie from hundred uh, from Macedonia is 180 kilos. Those plates look just man. It's best with my OCD. So you can see your hips moving up before nearly every rep before the bar leaves the floor. Except for that one. That one's okay. I just am so annoyed by how this plate these plates are loaded. Yeah, it doesn't actually look bad. Your hips are low for like three of those reps, but so make sure to fix that. Uh, Robert Glaser is 345. You are not setting your lower back at all. Your low back is not an extension. Um, so you need to fix that. Yeah, your back is in like full flexion and then at the top, it's ex you go into extension. It doesn't mean that you're going to hurt yourself. This bar is going to be forward. Yeah, it is. So um, really work on it. It may be the, where the belt is positioned, but your back is again in flexion and then only at the top you get it extended. So don't drop the last rep and extend your low back. Uh, so this is, we had Angel uh, Esperanza earlier. This is his dad, Alex. He says he's 72. Uh, cool. So here I would have him pull his chin down a little bit, not look in the mirror. You can see that his hips are low because they move up before the bar leaves the floor. So watch the hips this camera work. <laughs> I'm going to have to be more, uh, uh, I'm going to have to pick these videos a little bit better. But, uh, so I'd take that belt off. That belt is trash and uh, raise his hips up a little bit, pull his chin down, drag the bar up the legs. All right. So this is in Toronto. So this is what, 540. I'm going to pull this for, well, we'll see how many. These are deficit pulls. I'm standing on two mats, no belt. Uh, I like these and you can, uh, so I'm watching the plates to make sure I don't kick the bar forward or pull it back and I don't see any motion there. So that's good. And then I'm just going to see, uh, the bar looks to be tra traveling at my legs. That's fine. I should, I think I did this for a set of eight. That one, I probably could have held my back a little bit better. Yeah. Running, running out of energy. <laughs> yeah. The bar is bouncing all over the place. That's what I was just telling Baraki. Uh, so this is Leah, looks like this is 125, 130 kilos. Yeah, notice how long her pauses are. Yeah, yeah, she was doing doubles. Uh, this is Baraki, this is 495 plus 112 in chains. This is his last warm up for his top single. Yep. And again, watching the logo on the plates is really, is, is an easy trick here. That's, you know, so this is 545 plus 112 and chains. So 660, whatever. Yeah. And you see the York logo just dead, you know, it doesn't move. So his hips were in the right position. He didn't roll the bar around. That's pretty good. So this is 455. He's going to pull this for reps. Now you can see his back, like actually you can see it kind of move there. Now I think that he might've been in some overextension first and yeah, you can see him hold it in place, which I actually, I think this is totally fine. That one maybe could have held a little bit more extension, but you don't want overextension. You want normal anatomical position. And I think, you know, he's pretty close, close enough for me. That I don't, I don't, I wouldn't worry about that. Uh, all right. So this is, I'm doing two count pause bench. That pause was kind of trash, but there you go. Uh, yeah, so this bench is interesting. You would swing the uprights out in front of you and uh, you could do, give yourself a lift off. So I think for a uh, two count pause bench, these pauses are fast. Um, so I should have had somebody counting these, but you know, 315 and 365 after the day before doing 405 and 325 for regular comp bench. So, uh, well, I'll have to pause longer. And uh, this is Leah. 165. So 
This is touch and go bench. Now she does most of her bench work paused. So when she goes to touch and go, this is like a new movement. You can see that she didn't actually get a decent bounce. That bar actually bounced forward off her chest and it needs to go back towards the rack. So the whatever bench variation that you do most often is the one you're gonna be better at. And she is better at paused benching right now. So anyway, this has been training vlog number 24. I uh, hope you guys dug it. Uh, if you want to keep up to date on all the latest information, make sure you hit subscribe. If you like the video, hit like, leave us a comment below. If you want to submit us your own video, uh, media at barbellmedicine.com, submit a training video or a question or both, please shoot them landscape. Please make sure they're 1080p or high, higher. You can use like WeTransfer or some other uh, file sharing service like that to send it to us. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching. We'll catch you guys next time.